Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Mike the Carey Chapel Davao, and we're here again on Wednesday evening to our online Bible study in the book of Isaiah. This evening, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 6. He has a blessing. You know, in the end of the previous paragraph, back in chapter 59, that we studied last week, it predicted a time when God would put on righteousness and salvation, that he would judge the wicked, come to Zion as Redeemer, and establish his covenant relationship with his people through that special one who would have God's Spirit. This new message in chapter 60 is directly connected to that. And it alludes to the numerous ideas that we studied all the way back in chapter 2 and then all the way up through chapter 59. They were announcements about God's plan to come to Zion and transform this world where, where first found in chapters 2, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. So it's not surprising that we find another explanation of this wonderful promise about the nations coming to Zion here in chapter 60. Isaiah has provided a lot of you know, additional hints about his kingdom, like in chapters 9 and 11, which introduced to the Davidic Messiah and the gathering of the Hebrews and the Gentiles to Jerusalem. He identified people from nations who will be a part of God's righteous people. And he mentions the coming of the Spirit, the transformation of nature, the coming of the glory of the Lord, and God ruling his king over Zion. So in chapter 60, the thematic contacts with many of the other earlier prophetic speeches here in Isaiah, but it also has a unique emphasis here. In chapter 60. These descriptions of eschatological Zion are about the coming of God's light, the nations, Israel's sons, Israel's joy, so that his people may enhance the beauty of God's temple and honor God himself who will appear in all his splendor. This message, <coughs> excuse me, provides encouragement and hope for all the righteous people on the earth who continually pray that this glorious era, era here will come very soon. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we do pray your, for your soon coming, Lord, and we continue to pray for that continuously because we're anxiously waiting for you. So we pray that you'll teach us through your word this evening. Lord, put me aside, Lord. Use me as an empty vessel to speak to your people and teach us this, Lord, Lord, every one of us of the things that you would like us to hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Here in uh, verses, uh, or chapter 60, we'll start with verses 1 through 3. This is where it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, all deep darkness the people, and deep darkness of the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The glory here, or gabod in the Hebrew, of God refers to the majestic physical presentation or God's holiness as if that is visible to human sight. The glory of God appeared to Moses in the fire of the burning bush in Exodus 24, 15 through 17. The awesome appearance of God's glory appeared in the call of Ezekiel which involved an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. And the center of the fire looked like glowing metal in Ezekiel 1, 4 and 27. The bright light that is connected to the appearance of God's glory is also a symbol of God's salvation in Psalm 27, 1. The light is also called your light 
in Isaiah chapter 58, 8 and 10. The instructions of God here in verse 1 exhort his people in Zion to action, encouraging Zion to arise because a new day is coming. Arise, shine, for your light has come. You know, after the thick and separate darkness described in Isaiah 59 verses 9 through 10, this is the glorious rescue that comes from the Redeemer. Light has come. So God tells his people to respond to it, to arise and shine. You know, darkness is going down. It's like going to bed. Light is for rising up like in the morning. Darkness is for gloom and sleep. Light is for shining. When light has come, we must respond, respond and arise and shine. First, to receive God's light, your light has come. And then we have a service to perform, arise and shine. You know, you can't shine until your light has come. But once it's come, there's something wrong if you don't rise and shine with it. There are things to do. It says here, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. This isn't earthly light. This is light that emanates from the glory of the Lord. It's like the light of Jesus in the transfiguration. You know, when his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light in Matthew 17 too. Sometimes harsh, bright light can be disturbing or uncomfortable, but not this one. This is a warm, wonderful light that pulsates from the glory of God. It says here, Gentiles shall come to your light. You know, when the Lord lifts up his glorious light over Israel, the Gentile nations will see it and be attracted to it. Even kings will be attracted to the brightness of Israel's rising. <clears throat> Excuse me. There will be ultimately fulfilled with the millennial kingdom of Jesus when Israel is lifted up among all the nations. While in principle, this chapter is application to all of God's people. It's specifically directed at Israel, and it will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. Not everybody has seen this. In verse 3 here, it says the Lord's glory in Zion is related to the world's darkness as present everywhere on earth and blinding all people. The light dawning in Zion is the first banishment of this darkness and is designed to magnetize the world into blessing. The Lord starts with his people here in order to encompass the whole world. But the fact that the Lord speaks of the Gentiles here and that they will also receive this light in Psalm 67, verses 1 through 2, it says, God be merciful to us and bless us and, call, and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known to the earth, your salvation among all nations. This is the light within us that is spreading the word of God and drawing others to Christ when we go out evangelizing. This was Paul's thought in Romans 15, 16, where it says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, <coughs> ministering the gospel of God and the offering to the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 does not identify exactly which people will seek God's glory over, over Zion, but verse 3 answers that question. It says, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So we see a glimmer here of Israel's ministering to the Gentile nations. Then in verses 4 through 13, it says, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba, shall come. 
They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All of the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of, of Neboeth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roost? Surely the coastland shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, to the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring you to the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in procession. For the nation and kingdom will not serve you, shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. Verse 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the pine, and the box tree together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. <clears throat> Verse 4, the sun shall come from afar. You know, through this passage, one of the great things is the regathering. We can see that here in the millennial kingdom of Jesus. You know, every Jewish person remaining, remaining on earth will be gathered into the land of Israel from every nation on earth. We know that this has already started. It started back in 1948. The present day regathering of Israel is a precious preview of this ultimate complete gathering here. Verses 5 through 13, the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you and is showing all of that. Not only will they receive the treasure of their people, but also the literal treasure of the Gentiles shall come to Israel in the millennial kingdom. So the nations will willingly give them wealth. Much as the Egyptians willingly gave the Israelites riches when they left, uh, left Egypt in Exodus 12, 35 and 36. So much will be given that we'll need uh, they'll need to keep the gates of the city open continuously, as it says here. They shall bring gold, their silver and their gold with them. Why do the nations bestow these riches on little Israel? First, they recognize that they aren't really, that they're really giving it to God. They bring their silver and their gold with them to the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel. Secondly, they do it because they see the work of God in Israel, where it says, because he has glorified you. <clears throat> so they willingly gave it to, to, to and to serve Israel. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls, then their kings shall minister to you. Verse 13, to the beauty, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. You know, another reason that riches of the nation is born to Jerusalem, the millennial kingdom of Jesus, will be to build and support the millennial temple. The millennial temple. You know, it's described in great depth in Ezekiel uh, chapters 40 through 47, and it stands as a place mem memorializing memorializing God's present and work in history. There will also be a period to be priests and sacrifices at the, top, at the temple, but not for atonement because atonement was finished at the cross. And here in verses 14 through 18, it says also the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you. And all those who despised you shall shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. 
Whereas you have been forsaken and, forsaken and hated, so that no one went through you, I will make you an eternal excellence, a joy to many nations. You shall drink the milk of the Gentiles, and the milk of the breasts of kings. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, and you and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. And I will also make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. But you shall call your walls salvation and your gates pray. No, in verse 14, the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you. You know, those who have previously persecuted Israel, and specifically Jerusalem here, will have a different heart and mind in the millennial kingdom. They will come bowing to Jerusalem. They will recognize it as the city of the Lord. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. You know, God will take what was old and perhaps functional, but not full of glory and replace it with far better things. And even more of a miracle than that, turning bronze to gold is to turning the magistrates into righteousness. <clears throat> Who would have thought about that? In verse 18, it says, Vienna shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your wall salvation, your gates praise. What a glorious transformation here. From the violence and unrestrained bloodshed of Isaiah 59, verses 6 to 8, to the walls called salvation here, and the gates called praise. The ultimate fulfillment of these things awaits because of the millennial king and isn't here yet. But the king of that kingdom is here and wants to do some of that work on a different level, on different levels in our lives. For example, a home can be a beautiful transformation right now. It can be said of a Christian home, violence shall no longer be heard in your home, neither wasting nor destruction in your walls but you shall call your wall salvation and your doors praise. In reality, the nation won't need rulers, the judges, the government, officials to keep people in line if everyone follows everyone follow the principles of the righteousness and peace, selfishness and pride and anger and deceit and covetousness and Every other sort of evil no longer rule in the hearts of mankind. God will transform people's hearts so that they have new desires, new godly values, and new motivations. We do. It will direct their thoughts and actions. Back in verse 16, it says, You shall know. This explains why God does this. It's not because Israel is so great and has <clears throat> earn this as an achievement through hard work. He does it so you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. He does a work so great that all know it's his doing. <clears throat> then in verses here, 19 through 22, it says, the sun, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor your brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be ended. Also your people shall be righteousness. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands that I may be glorified. A little one shall come, become a thousand, and a small one, a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time, in its time. 
You know, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light. This is like the light of the New Jerusalem described, described in Revelation 21 to 23, where the Lord himself is the light. But just as important as having the Lord as your everlasting light is having your God your glory and to the glory no one or anything else. No, they shall inherit the land forever. You know, when we remember the context of Isaiah's prophecy here, it makes it even more precious. Isaiah was mostly written under the shadow of the coming defeat and exile. To those dispossessed people of God, Isaiah pointed them to them a day when they shall inherit the land forever. You know, this promise wouldn't be fulfilled because the people of God were so good, but it will be fulfilled so it will be seen as the work of my hands that I may be glorified. That's the Lord. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. You know, God didn't say what would happen soon, but when we consider eternity, we might consider it soon. But when God would hasten it, hurry it along, expedite it, it's time. In its time. When its time has come, the Lord will hasten it, but not before its time. So the promise seems too good to be true, and we, you know, we're conditioned to think that if it seems too good to be true, it is. But God is too good for it not to be true. You know, the promise to Abraham was that God would make of him a great nation and, and that his children would become as numerous as the stars in the heavens or the dust of the earth. That was in Genesis 12, 2 and 13, 15 through 16 and uh, 15, 5 and 16, 10 and 22, 17. Now God repeats the promise that most at that the most insignificant or powerless person or a tribe will greatly multiply and become a thousand strong. The least among the nations will become a mighty and powerful nation. You know, the promise of divine blessing and multiplication and strengthening can only, strengthening can only be explained as the marvelous work of God. The noun clause, I am Yahweh, confirms who will, be, who will do these things. That it's an oath-like assurance that promises a sure fulfillment. No, we shouldn't have doubt or wonder about these wonderful promises. For when the right time comes and everything is ready, God will quickly act and accomplish what he has promised to us. This assurance is to every believer is an encouragement to faithfully persevere each day. But it also provides hope that soon God will come for his righteous people and end the misery that's associated with the sinful world. You know, Isaiah's fascinating portrait of the coming kingdom displays the magnificence of God. It's God who is lifted up when the kingdom comes. However, he has chosen to lift up with him the people of Israel whom he has chosen. But Gentiles aren't excluded from this. Their presence in the chapter shows they will enjoy God's presence as well. A similar promise is made to glorify the future church of the saints in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 12. This is where it says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among, among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of the goodness and the work of faith with power, that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, the redeemed of all ages will stand in the joyful, powerful presence of God in his real and material kingdom on earth, a kingdom of righteousness that begins at the second advent, second advent of Christ when he comes the next time. Are you ready? Do you know him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, to, that uh, if there's anyone here that hasn't heard this message about Jesus, Lord, that they would um, turn and accept him as their Lord and Savior, Lord, knowing that they, that they won't make it, Lord, unless they do. They need a Redeemer. They need a Savior just like we have. We thank you so much for that, Lord, that we are the redeemed. We are the saved through his blood. And we pray, Lord, that anyone here that has not done that will turn and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and that they will do it soon. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, beloved. I'll see you next week. We'll, we'll start off in... Uh, Isaiah chapter 61. God bless.